Welcome to Rock Shop Talk. Our show talks best practices, fun anecdotes, and the latest cutting-edge technology in our field to kick your screen printing gears into hyperdrive. Today's episode features the topics of the pro tunnels and flash dryers the pros use. And we're joined by our special guest, Kevin Oakley of Stoked on Printing, and Rock US's own channel manager, Brian Richards. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be right back. We're excited to announce that we're moving warehouses and running our first ever rock moving sale on the Rock Fit 4 Color 8 Station and Rock U 6 Color 8 Station. For details on this exclusive opportunity expiring soon, please visit rock.us slash pages slash moving dash sale or call 187-ROCKET-NOW. That's 877-674-8669. All right, I want to welcome everybody back to the show. Today's episode features tunnels and flash dryers the pros use. We are joined today by special guest Kevin of Stoked on Printing and Rock US's own channel manager, Mr. Brian Richards. I am Rock US president, Ross Hunter. Sitting alongside me here is our creative director, Mr. Merrill Caps. Hello, hello. Awesome. So we want to kick off uh, the show today, uh, give a really cool update. Um, we've been talking about this elusive tour bus for the last, I believe, like nine episodes or something. Since the beginning of time, I think, for the show. Yeah. I love RV purchasing and then retrofitting mm. at places during COVID because uh, nothing goes according to plan. But we actually have a bus. Do we have a picture? We sure do. Coming at you hot. Oh, Let's here see. we go. Oh, look at the special effects. It's a wow. beauty. It's a beauty. It needs to be wrapped. So that's where it's off to now. Um, Dallas from Opaque Printing is uh, local here to us. And uh, he's, a, he's a part of our rock family as well and uh, does a lot of vinyl. So he'll be putting a pretty awesome, awesome wrap on the bus. We did do the inside. Do you have interior pictures? Uh, not that you want to show yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Although we do have one of us. It's kind of fun. Let's see. Sitting in. The oh, there we go. Oh, you can oh, see the wow. chairs. Yeah. We redid them with the rock green and black. So we reupholstered the whole inside. It's. Uh, I can't wait to be stuck in this bus with you guys for days on end. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so great. It's going to be the best. And I don't get paid to say that. I, I feel like there might be a tinge of sarcasm in Brian's voice, right now, but I do think we'll have fun. We, we, we will be fun. We had buses for the Long Beach show in January. Um, we parked uh, two Class A's actually right outside the convention center. We were about 100 feet from our booth. And uh, I think we had three people per bus, and it was fun. It was good bonding. And I didn't have to walk far to get to our booth, which it was, was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sat Real out in the days. morning, you know, watched all the semi trucks go by with everyone's equipment. It was good times. <laughs> so we are excited. We are going to try to plan a trip to some um, less infected states uh, up in the Northeast to at least do like a dry run to make sure the bus does not explode or fall apart. Very important. Um, so we're thinking like Montana. I think there's like two cases in Montana of COVID. So We've got about more rocks than cases. There. Yeah, we have more. We have more rocks there than we do have uh, COVID That's cases. That's the ratio we're looking. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so stay tuned for that. We'll get everything up on the website. We'll have some hashtags to follow um, across all our social media platforms. We'll make sure everyone knows uh, where we're at. So if you want to visit, um, just email us. Uh, what's our best email for that? Hello. Hello. At Hello rock. at rock.us. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Is it Brian you're looking for? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so we want to kick this off. Uh, again, we got uh, Kevin of Stoked On with us. Thank you for joining us today, man. I yeah, thanks for having, having me. You out. Absolutely. And, uh, and Brian Richards, our, our channel manager here at Rock. So do you want to kind of kick uh, off with the, uh, let's let's get some dryer talk. <laughs> let's talk about dryers. Arguably the, the sexiest uh, piece of equipment that we could uh, possibly be talking about. Um, yeah. Kev, uh, you, you have a couple of dryers, right? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We have the, um, the, I don't know exactly what the exact, uh, model it is, but it's the 70 inch wide belt with the 20 foot, um, tunnel. Sounds like um, a 6018. That 30, sounds 30 exactly right. Total. Is that what it is? Yeah. We, we added, actually, we added an extension to the, uh, the outfeed. 
just because mm-hmm. I was just getting so hot, you know, pulling them off. So we added, I think, an additional six or seven feet on that. So, nice. yeah. So Very kept the cool. in feet the same, but yeah. People got to take off the gloves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it was yeah. just like it, we had, you know, had gloves and it's already pretty hot here. So it was just like adding hot with hot and mm-hmm. it was just not doing good. But yeah, so adding just that extra six feet just made all the difference in the world because especially with like fans and swamp coolers, you're able just to get like a nice, you know, uh, feeling and you're not burning your fingertips off, you know, by the time you got to start stacking. So absolutely. I think there's a dog joining us <laughs> somewhere. I hear one. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what has been your, obviously that's not where you guys started, right? That's a, that's a beast of a, uh, of a gas tunnel. What, what has been your, your drier evolution, I guess, if you could, uh, just surmise it, you know, quickly, um, and what kind of points, you know, what, when do you know that, okay, we need to make this jump from, from one to the next. And what does that look like for your shop over time? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we started, you know, we, we, we started in a spare bedroom. So we were obviously starting, uh, drying with a flash unit, which is a terrible idea. And you need to get off of that as soon as possible. Um, then we got like a, uh, it was like a Harco, um, infrared panel. And that was the tunnel was maybe like three feet long. Um, and we actually bought our, you know, it's fine for a manual to have like a, you know, a smaller size, um, tunnel. Um, because you can go slow, you know, it just needs, a, it's, it's a crawl to get through that thing. Um, we actually bought our first auto and we we're like, all right, this is not the business. Like we, it, it was an old auto. It was like a 1995 tough javelin. And even that thing, we were just like, okay, we need to get a dryer because you can only go as fast as your dryer allows, you know, at a certain point on your press. So then we got a, another really old, um, it was actually a Hopkins dryer which is kind of a, it was like a rare find. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. It was like, yeah. So it was um, Hopkins infrared, probably from like the late eighties, early nineties. Anyways, it didn't work really well. Um, So it wasn't drying, you know? So it's like one of those things where it's me, not the sexiest piece of equipment in the, in the shop, but when it's not working, Mm -hmm. you might as well not be doing anything because Mm -hmm. if it's, you know, washing out and all those types of things, um, you know, then we, then we went up to, uh, um, a workhorse, uh, one of those like uh, quartz bulb dryers. And that was, that was okay, but it just took a bunch of uh, power and we were like, we need to move to gas. Um, and then we got a, like a used air jet that we got for a really cheap price, which was good. Um, you know, it's another step and it was another evolution up because uh, we, we got into gas, but the thing just, it eats gas. It is just, uh, it's a machine, you know? So uh, then from there, we're like, okay, we need to get efficient, you know, a little bit more energy efficient. Uh, we need a longer tunnel, those types of things. And then that's when we got, uh, to, uh, the rock tunnel. Interesting. So, I, I think that, yeah. that, uh, I think that mirrors, uh, you know, quite a bit of, um, the experience that folks have as they're growing a, an operation. Like you, how, how long have you guys been around now? It's been a, f- yeah, we're, uh, been 10 years since we moved years. into our wow. for that. And that's when we moved into our first shop. Um, so we were screen printing in the house for probably about two to three years before that. Nice. So, so it sounds like kind of the beginning part of that phase is just production mindset, keeping up. I need to do more, I need to cure more, you know, we need bigger dryers production wise. And then at a certain point, you're, you're a big operation, you've got large volume already. And then it kind of shifts to more of an efficiency, uh, mindset. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you, you need work to focus before you, you, you really need to get your work going before you can focus on profitability because, you know, a, if you're selling zero, the profit is not there. Right. Mm-hmm. So you, you really need to get those things and you really kind of need to, and I think screen printing and as, as far as screen printing shops are very good at like bootstrapping and just making things happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just the way we did it too. But then you get to a certain point, you're like, okay, um, I'm worrying more about like, I'm stressing out more about is this shirt curing, um, versus like, how's the quality of the print? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, the, and so those are definitely things where you just need to spend the money so that you can focus on things that really push the business forward. You know, that a dryer should not hold back your business. Well, and once you get to that volume too, you know, you, you don't cure 10,000 shirts by accident. 
And yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty expensive mistake or at least a timely one to fix, bringing them all back and attempting to run them back through or heat press them or whatever you're having to do to try to solve that situation at that point. How many presses are you running on your big dryer? Because So we talked about the dryer evolution. I'm assuming a, a good chunk of that evolution had to do with as you were adding more printing equipment, you kind of stopped at, I, I believe, the Javelin. So when you guys made the switch into the larger tunnel from rock, was that at the same time that you added presses or, or maybe talk a little bit about how that, how they evolved together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so yeah, so we had the javelin, we moved up, um, right around the same exact time we got the air jet. We actually got e the, uh, like an older used challenger two. Okay. Um, and then once again, it just allowed us to enter that new level of having, you know, 14 colors and those types of things. We added another challenger. So we're running both of those on there. And okay, so you've got two, two yep. large presses then running on the one dryer. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Both 14, 16s running on that air jet. And we were moving into a new facility and we really made the decision to move to new equipment just because once again, we were, we we're spending too much time uh, fixing machines, worrying about if a machine needs to be fixed, all of these different components that didn't really have value for our customers. So we said, okay, we're just going to buy brand new equipment. Um, that's when we you know, connected with uh, Rock and Ryan and uh, decided, you know, hey, we're going to buy. So we bought a 1620 Eco um, and then an 812 U, um, both XL. And at that same time, we obviously needed a dryer. Um, and we just really liked what we saw when we looked at the comparisons of how much, how efficient that Brock Tunnel was versus um, some of the other competitors. And it, uh, and then obviously it just made sense, you know, uh, we're already buying, you know, rock stuff. Um, and the maintenance on it, on everything was just very appealing to move with the rock tunnel versus, um, getting another air jet or, you know, something else like that. Absolutely. And you make kind of an important point that I think a lot of folks don't think about. And I know you guys are kind of, you know, we're looking at, at some other equipment for you guys right now. I know you've been working with us on that. And I, I haven't been directly involved with it, but I've been indirectly involved in it. And you guys definitely do your homework on every single cost that's associated with a, a big purchase. I mean, whether you're buying a dryer and you're talking about gas consumption or electrical consumption, can you take me through like, when did that start? Cause you guys have been doing this now for 13 years. And I know a lot of screen printers. I mean, I owned a business myself in, in this field for, for 10 years. Right. And one thing I always feel like we struggle with as an industry is bringing the business into our business. Like we could be the best printer on earth or the best artist on earth, or, you know, have great customers and all that kind of stuff. But when you go out to buy capital equipment, it's not just, you know, does it do the job? there's so much more involved. So can you speak a little bit about that process and, and kind of help, you know, our listeners understand what you guys go through when you're looking at that capital equipment and, and getting into something new so they understand that process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I wish I would have known a lot of these things back when we were buying some of these used presses, but at a certain point you really can only manage what you can afford. Right. So, you know, at that time we might've said, Hey, we can, you know, uh, buying a new press would be good, um, but we couldn't afford it. So th this really goes back to, um, I would say 2013 or so, um, you know, we really started picking up momentum. We started picking up more and more customers and we realized that we needed to increase our capacity. We increase all those things. So we looked at, okay, what does a new press cost? What does used press cost? Um, what does the capital expenditure of those presses bring in value on a daily basis because you, you really need to be putting out units. So you can say, well, uh, you know, a, a press is double the cost, but it might be running twice as, as efficient when you look at things like um, heads breaking, you know, cylinders breaking, um, all of these different things that you're spending indirect money along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, you really might look at the numbers and say, okay, this other new machine uh, is actually going to outperform, even though the capital expenditures double the cost. 
Um, so we really started looking at some of those things when we broke down, um, you know, all of the maintenance costs, all of those things. And it's an evolution as far as how deep into the numbers you go. Um, and the one biggest thing that I can say to people who maybe are not there yet is you have to get out of production and you have to have people in place that can take those, uh, that could take your place in production so that you therefore can focus on these things. Because as I think a lot of us, I've been in that position. Um, my partner Shane and I have both been in this position and I still see a lot of people stuck in this, um, um, I don't know, like a valley where you're so consumed with um, being on press, making the screens, doing all of these things that you really can't see like a higher level of what's really going to move the business forward. And once you can get out of that valley, you, it's just momentum. You're just like, you're pushing a, a boulder down a hill instead of up it. Um, right. And I don't, I don't know exactly when that, like an exact time frame happened with that, uh, with us, but I could tell you once you get there, you can start looking at like gas consumption and power consumption, you know, um, because I'm probably, those are the long-term costs of ownership, right? So it's like yeah. one thing, most people think about the big dollar, right? It's like, oh my God, I'm spending $60,000 on this dryer. That's a lot. And then, you know, you're comparing brands and okay, this and this and this, what people aren't looking at is, you know, if it's electric, you know, how much electric am I going to consume, you know, down to calling your electric company, which we've done for some folks, I think, right? We, we've done it. And it's, it's been something that has, um, you know, not, not tripped me up, but has, um, you know, presented roadblocks because, you know, the rate for electricity and gas consumption is very localized, right? It'll change by the region. And so, you know, someone's cost may be a lot different in moving from electric to gas in one part of the country compared to another. Um, so it's always hard to gauge. But like when you guys were doing the research and looking at that, making that jump, obviously you had a, a pain point in the electric dryer. You could tell that for the volume you were doing, it was costing you too much on like a monthly basis. But how do you really like get in to understand like how much you're going to save? Is it like you're looking up the the kilowatts per hour and you're like understanding, you know, electric versus gas, are you doing that beforehand? And if so, you know, when you actually get the gas unit in there, is it reflective of what you are expecting in terms of like a, um, a decrease in monthly cost? Yeah. So there was a couple of things that went into it that is aside from price, like the actual cost of it. Um, in my opinion, a gas dryer dries garments better. Sure. It is it is a, is an all encompassing uh, heat, whereas you know, uh, you know, infrared or you know, quartz bulbs and these types of things are just pressing heat downward, mm -hmm. right? Um, whereas you know, a, where you're really baking a shirt with uh, with uh, a gas dryer, which ultimately expands the options that you're allowed to to do as far as printing goes, because your water based printing is going to be uh, much more uh, effective when you have a gas dryer versus a, you know, electric dryer. Mm -hmm. um, there were certain things where through the course of our evolution of getting electric dryers and maybe not the best ones, you know, there's, there's some cold spots, you know, there's these things where, so if you're discharging, Hey, like this little spot is just not discharging. Like, what are we, are we not doing pressure enough? No, it's the dryer. You and know, you're, there's running, you're running slow too, right? You're running you very to, slow. Yeah, yeah. So I know you guys have like some some uh, or not rock, but Ryanet has some interesting, um, you know, some electric options with forced air and those types of things that really help with that, uh, which is good. But ultimately, uh, the idea I think with most shops is is to get to a gas uh, dryer so that you're 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 encompassing that that garment with heat. And you're not worrying about like, oh, am I scorching a shirt, you know, by curing it with this electric dryer? Um, can I not do water base effectively? Um, and, and those types of things. Um, and then really, we didn't really know the exact amount of money we were going to save when we went from electric to gas. But I can say we, we were able to get a baseline when we went from the air jet to the rock tunnel. Because essentially what we were able to do is saying, okay, well, how much gas are we using? Uh, you know, in June of last month, and then how much gas are we using of June 
or uh, June last year and June of this year, because that was the, that's the only indicator, right? Is we added this rock tunnel and we can see like, okay, we're only using 20% more gas or so, or something like that. I, I don't know how the numbers off the top of my head, mm-hmm. but it was not double, right? It was not like a hundred percent more gas we were using. So then we were like, oh, okay, that's, we're way more efficient now. So Awesome. I wanted to take you back to something you mentioned when you guys first got started, you know, in, in the bonus room or, or the living room, yeah. you know, and um, I mean, this is for people that are really just getting into this industry that might be listening, but what, what are the, the big important differences, right? Between going, or actually we should just talk about it from a technical level, but you started just with a flash dryer and you said, you know, I don't, I won't quote you exactly, but don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Get a conveyor as soon as <laughs> yeah. possible. Can you explain to our listeners that maybe are curing with a flash right now, like why that's so important just from a technical standpoint? Yeah. Um, a, it's time consuming. Um, B, it's, uh, it depends on like the situation because I, I, I know some guys like family industries, right? When they're out at live events, they're using a flash dryer, um, because it's, it's convenient, right? They're on the, they're in an event space, you know, you don't have to have huge power. Um, but at home, um, you know, time is money, right? It, it's, you have to get things done the fastest to make the most amount of money. And so when you're sitting there, um, you know, with a flash dryer carrying a shirt for like four minutes or something like that, um, it's taking you away from doing something else that's going to make you more money. Um, because that's why we're all here is opportunity it, cost. Yes. Right? Yeah. And you know, it, it's a difference between what you want out of what you're doing. You know, if, if you're doing this as a hobby, as a, um, as just something for fun to do on the side, um, then maybe it is not the most important thing for you to go to a conveyor. But if you're here to make money, um, you can set a shirt onto a conveyor belt and it moves it through the tunnel and then the tunnel, uh, will, dry the shirt for you. So that's a small form of automation. Whereas with the, with the flash dryer, you're going to, you're going to burn your shirt, uh, far more frequently. Um, and also depending on where you're putting that, um, wherever you're drying it, like for instance, we were, um, we were doing it on like an, uh, on a pallet. We just had like the silver press from, from Ryan. It was our first press that we stuck on like a table. And we just had one of the stations was our curing uh, platen and it got like unbelievably hot. Like, you know, so you were, you were, uh, you're kind of dealing with like a little bit of a danger zone too, you know, when you have this thing just sitting on a, on a platen for, you know, hours on end. Absolutely. So. Cool. That was a good takeaway. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we will be back to talk more dryers and heat. Yeah. The Rock Tunnel Conveyor Dryer is your plug-in, turn-on, and forget solution that seamlessly matches the speed and volume of Rock Auto Presses. A machine that's easy to operate and doesn't make a ruckus. With an easy-to-take-off side panel, maintaining the tunnel is simple and incredibly quiet. The Rock Tunnel Conveyor Dryer is the hardest working piece of equipment you'll find in any shop and there's no slowing this thing down. It turns out having tunnel vision can sometimes be a rewarding thing after all. I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we discuss all things screen printing. Today's episode features tunnels and flash dryers, the pros use, and we are joined by our special guest, Kevin of Stoked On Printing and Rock US's own channel manager, Mr. Brian Richards, along with myself, Ross, and our creative director, Mr. Merrill Caps. Hello. Thank you for having me. So let's dive back into some dryers. Whew. Heating up. Ooh, it uh, is. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> it is. We, we can. Ideas. We can. You know, it's 106. Kevin was saying in Vegas. So we, can't, <laughs> yeah. we can't make too many jokes up here in the in the greater <laughs> Pacific Northwest. But uh, on the topic of uh, dryers, I know earlier, Kev, we talked a little bit about um, you know the the fullness of the cure of a, that a gas dryer provides, and it really helped you guys be able to. Um, you know, have the flexibility to run quicker and uh, and more thorough on discharge garments and and uh, water based garments. Do you guys um, are you running like a lot of different things at the same time? Do you have a split belt or do you do you see a need there for um, split belts in the shop? You know, running multiple presses down the same belt. Um, so we don't have a split belt 
And what we try to do is we try to find a middle ground of like, we're going to be running 100% and 60-40s and these types of things because we we have ink that we found runs great on 100% and 60-40s. So like on 100% cotton t-shirts, we use the same exact ink as we do with a 60-40 or 50-50. Mm. Um, the only other time we really change things is when we move to 100% poly or we're doing like any type of like polypropylene bags or those types of things. Um, where you really have to jam that dryer through or else you're going to be melting the bags. Um, so in those situations, I think it'd be huge. However, we just don't do a ton of poly. So mm-hmm. for any shops that are doing a lot of, um, you know, active wear um, or for like sports teams or for schools, I think a split belt's a really good idea because you're going to have a mix of like spirit wear, which is just generally like your 60-40 blends or your 100% blends. And then you're also doing the you know, the actual team wear, which is mostly polyester and those types of things. So it, it's, it'd be a huge benefit. Um, it just, in our market, it just made more sense to uh, just go with one, one belt. Mm-hmm. You guys, um, I know you do a fair amount of um, fulfillment and digital printing as well. Is that a, a separate dryer that you use for that process then? It is. Yeah. So right now we do have, um, it, it's a, it's called a firefly dryer. So it just kind of, fluctuates temperatures based upon, you know, if we're printing a tri-blend or 60-40, 100% cotton. Mm-hmm. However, um, moving forward, we will probably expand more into just using gas dryers because for the same reason, we, we've ran tests and we were able to really see there's not a huge fluctuation if we're running 100% cotton in a 60-40, um, even with uh, the, you know, water-based DTG ink um, with uh, just going through a gas dryer at the same temperature at the same time. Um, so it's a lot cheaper once again to go back to gas. Um, and it is definitely something we're looking at and running, crunching all the numbers um, to do so. Well, and that's a place where that split belt could actually come in handy too. I know I've seen some shops that'll run, you know, digital on one side and running screen prints through the other, you know, on the two separate belts, just at separate speeds, it does get tricky with temperature, right? I mean, there are cases where that works and you can just change your, your belt speeds. And there's other cases where, where it doesn't work, but that's a good point on gas. I mean, cause digital ink essentially is just water-based. I mean, it's chemically obviously different because it's going through a a print head, but um, you know, similar curing parameters, right? Totally. Yeah, low, exactly. low, low and slow is, is low. kind of the general rule of, rule of thumb. <laughs> yep, exactly. Yeah. Like and, 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 you know, yeah, mm-hmm. and exactly. And it, it, depending upon, you know, the digital, you know, machine you're going to be using, some machines you have to use gas, you know, to, to really evaporate that water um, or that moisture out of the, the garment. Nice. Okay. Right on. Um, what are, do you, how do you guys, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in a, in a print shop. You know, you've got your hands in a bunch of different things all at once. The show must go on in production. When your team needs to switch from one type of garment or one type of ink to another, is that something, how do you guys keep track of like making sure that the settings on the dryer kind of reflect those changes that need to happen? Yeah. So it's up to the production manager. So, you know, so we have a person on the floor who is just um, the go-to guy for all the press teams. So he's the one who's making sure the print looks good. You know, he's approving it based upon the mock-up, the tech sheet, those types of things. And then he's also looking at the blend, making sure, okay, we're going to be good running it through the dryer. Um, Once again, I would say we're not as good as we should be changing our, um, settings very much, you know, but once again, we just find a kind of like a nice equal ground where we're not migrating, we're not doing, um, it, having any of those problems. And we're, you know, we're curing hundred percent, 60, 40 is all at the same time, um, without having any of those issues. And, and there's other things you can do on the press, you know, and with your inks that will help that cause, you know, so it's just a lot of doing a lot of different testings, to make sure uh, you can also run your dryer that that same way, um, but we we don't really ever have any dryer or migration uh, issues, so it's it's not really that big of a deal. Nice. And the the rock tunnels got recipes too, so you can like kind of figure out things that work for certain 
ink types or certain garment types and just kind of click back to it, you know, when you need to, to switch gears and you kind of know what works for you, you can set it up that way, mm -hmm. which is, yep. is a very nice feature. So once you get the secret sauce going, it's nice just to press a button. I, I, I do always like to point out to people though, after, you know, teaching it for as many years as I have in this industry and, and please chime in on this as well. But what a lot of folks don't think about when it comes to drying, you know, they, they get their setting that works, right? And they go and they go and they go and it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And then all of a sudden, ink washes out doing the same thing. And they're like, you know, get phone calls, get people hitting you up. Hey, what, what happened? You know, my ink's bad. This ink and, doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, they don't realize that it's winter time and their warehouse is not temperature controlled. And yep. the dryer settings all have to change because it's cold, you know, yep. compared to right now, how hot, I, I don't know. Do you guys, you guys have central air and stuff in your, I'm assuming most don't. We, we, we have a pretty low humidity uh, level here. So we use swamp coolers. Oh, which, cool. You know, so it keeps so. it kind of cool, but it's still hot. So it's still hot. Probably yeah. running dry your dryers. <laughs> yeah. 106. Dry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, it's a dry. I know my <laughs> shop in LA would get up to like, you know, 110 inside sometimes Ooh. and, uh, it was crazy, but we even had those problems, you know, in the winter time, someone would screw up and forget it's, you know, 40, 50 degrees in the shop. And all of a sudden I get a call that ink washed out and it's like, oh, geez. So quick tip for everyone listening, uh, make sure you're paying attention to the weather inside your shop and adjusting your dryer uh, accordingly and, and making sure you're running tests on stuff before you run giant runs of my, shirts. My favorite dryer snafu that we would run into pretty regularly uh, back in the first in the first print shop I worked at, which, uh, you know, shout out to Ink Monkey Graphics if you're listening, uh, was we would always shut the dryer off, right? Just the heat, leave the belt on because you don't want yeah, the belt yeah. to fry, right? So you shut the dryer off, you go to lunch, and then you come back an hour later, maybe after a beer, <laughs> and uh, you start rolling shirts and all of a sudden you're realizing they're just coming out wet at the end of the dryer and you got to spray out a hundred shirts. That's always, and you always got the ink on the back. I think always maybe the shirt. beer was the reason. For I don't that, think Brian. so. I'm not going to blame it. I, I, blame I, blame I blame the dryer. I blame the dryer for not coming back on and knowing you guys are there. No, I, well, and also to your point, Ross, uh, another big thing that I think, uh, especially when you're using an electric dryer, um, you know, those change in temperatures are very critical, but also uh, if it's windy and you're close to a door, um, if you have those gusts of wind come through, that is going to offset the temperature in the dryer. So that's always something I always recommend, um, you know, especially in smaller shops when you're, you know, you got maybe the roll up door, you know, and you're, you're kind of, you know, jamming shirts out. Um, you really want to make sure you probably roll that door down if it gets windy because you're going to have that gust coming through and that's going to create a whole different environment inside of the tunnel. Absolutely. So. And humidity makes a big difference too. I remember doing a console with a, a company out in Kentucky and man, it was, it was brutal. I mean, it was over a hundred percent humidity, even though that's not possible. <laughs> it's like you walk out of your vehicle and you're wet, you know? Yeah. And, yep. um, they were having a lot of those same struggles because they were they were keeping the roll ups open and they were trying to keep air flowing through the building and they didn't have any way to you know at the time dehumidify and i mean it would take them forever to cure anything because the shirts had so much moisture on them before they went in that dryer that you know it, it caused a lot of problems so True. You know, air flow is important to think about temperature and then you know humidity for your dryer as well so when you I mean, obviously you bought a lot of dryers. I mean, this yeah. has been like an, evol <laughs> this has been an evolution for sure. Um, are there specific things that you could tell our listen listeners just to watch out for or think about? I mean, we talked about consumption and stuff, but like just in general, like technologically, like what are some important things, you know, other than gas? So let, let's use electric dryers because I think they have more mm, differences on them just in terms of like, being able to lower and raise your heating elements, what type of heating elements are best? Do you have any any kind of tips for people that are at a trade show or, or whatever, just sort of looking around and they're in the market? Yeah, um, I think, you know, obviously the company uh, who you buy from, you know, their support level um, is very big, especially when you're talking about electrical, um, because electrical, 
there's components inside of those there that were are, are essentially built to break, you know, so it doesn't ruin the rest of the, you know, uh, dryer, you know, so you want to make sure you are a getting some really good support. Um, and then B, I think, you know, any type of forced air, you know, even with an electrical dryer so that you're kind of blowing, you know, it's kind of like a convection bake, you know, um, is a way I like to, you know, uh, when I'm, when I'm talking to people who, who don't know about forced air, I'm like, you know, a convection oven, you know, it's just blowing the air around. Um, so I think that's a really good thing to look out for. Um, I really, if I'm going to go to electric dryers, I, I, I really enjoy quartz bulbs um, just because they're able to uh, kind of fluctuate, you know, so uh, you're able to maintain a little bit steady over temperature and you're not dealing with those like cold spots that I mentioned with uh, infrared panels. Um, which just means, you know, parts of those, it, and it's not, it, it's going to be on an older aged, you know, panel. Um, but eventually those are just things you kind of have to worry about and uh, look out for. And so, I mean, for people looking at infrared, I know looking for companies that, you know, warranty those heating elements for, I mean, I think there's companies out there that warranty those for almost life, right? Where they'll just replace the heater 10, 10 years. 15 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's a long time. And and now the technology's changed a little bit where most of the you know, mid-sized to larger electric dryers are coming with multiple um temperature zones where you know you can blast, you know, your garment in the first like, you know, eight to ten inches of going into that into that dryer and then maybe drop your heat down so you don't scorch um yep. as it runs through. So I definitely tell people look for multiple heat zones. It, it allows you a lot more versatility too between types of inks. So if you're moving from plastisol to water base to discharge, et cetera, having, you know, the ability to control more, I think is, is super, super, super important. Yeah, very much so. What's, uh, what's been your favorite food that you've sent down the belt uh, <laughs> trying to heat it up? Well, of course, pizza. I think pizza is probably like the most uh, every most shop. Notable. Every yeah. shop has done this. Has done the pizza. Um, yep. I did. I did some chicken fingers a couple of times. No, way. Uh, that worked out pretty well. Um, obviously, you know, just like you know, you get into the shop. It's, you know, you're you're getting your coffee. Just throw your muffin through. You know, mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say, but definitely pizza. I think it's a classic. I think does it does you it change the do taste it. at all? Yeah, it just got, you know, gets you like that little, uh, just that plastisoli, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, all the good stuff. Yum. I've always actually wanted to make a screen printing cookbook. Oh, I thought it'd be really it. fun we're to like, because I used to heat press grilled cheeses and like quesadillas at my shop. We've sent pizzas through the conveyor. I mean, all I thought, how fun would it be to actually do like a cookbook for, we're, for we're, screen printing for the record that's <laughs> happening yeah 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 that's happening. it was kind of funny we actually were supposed to be i forget what show it was this year um i mean for our listeners just you know i, I believe every show has been canceled through the year iss uh as well as uh, print united but one of the shows we were supposed to be at was going to be in the same convention center at the same time as a, a pizza convention hmm. And so I thought, how cool would it be to like set up a rock, right? Have like a 36 mesh screen, mm-hmm. print pizza sauce onto <laughs> dough through the screen. Yep. And then in the next, you know, screen set up uh, where, you know, your, your squeegee and flood bar hook cheese into the squeegee and then have a cheese grater underneath and just have the head print multiple times. So I'd go to the next station, print the cheese, and then run it through the dryer. I just like you I had did this. Think a lot about. That. I really did. I was I was excited, <laughs> and I'm kind of bummed that I'm not going to get to do it because I had this great master plan of like you can screen print T-shirts or make a pizza. That's amazing. Or, or finishing or be, the Parmesan. Uh-huh. You know, finishing before. Or if yeah. you could do. Or if you could do. Um. If you could flock cheese onto it. Oh. I'm not sure. Oh, the, yeah. uh, <laughs> I want to get Danny on that one. <laughs> yeah, I hit up Danny or, or John, John who Lewis. loves, mm-hmm. loves, loves oh, the yeah. flock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That. That's cool. Um, let's uh, dive into another commercial break. And when we come back, uh, we'll get into some flashes, maybe talk about that a little bit and dive more into dryers. We'll be oh. right back. Typically, a dry run refers to a dress rehearsal, but not this time. Your Rock US Dry Run Quartz Flash Dryer is designed to give you winning performance at a budget price. 
To get the most out of your press and offer the best quality for your customers every time, upgrade in a flash, because this is no dress rehearsal. For these and other expert supplies to help you press onward, please visit Rock US or call 1-87-ROCKET-NOW. That's 877-674-8669. So I want to welcome everybody back to Rock Shop Talk, your one-stop rock shop where we discuss all things screen printing. Today's episode features tunnels and flash dryers. We are joined by Kevin Oakley of Stoked On Printing, as well as Brian Richards, uh, Rock US Channel Manager. And I'm Ross Hunter, sitting alongside of our creative director, Mr. Merrill Caps. So, so let's, uh, we we're kind of having some, some funny jokes in the break there about... Uh, fires well we, we talked about <laughs> an anxiety <laughs> and screen printing ptsd yes um <laughs> and, we, and we we went into um you know issues and and uh problems i guess uh mistakes that happen on conveyors and uh it led me into thinking you know uh about the the age-old uh anxiety inducing um question that every screen printer has when they're either eating dinner or getting ready to go to sleep which is did i turn the flash dryer off <laughs> <laughs> and uh we've all been there and i've uh you know i've i've had to um get up in the middle of the night and literally drive to the shop just to to make sure it wasn't burning down um, any, uh <laughs> any um stories kevin any uh is that something that you've dealt with Oh, absolutely. Um, we had, uh, geez, where do I start? Um, okay. So like one thing I said, it was like, is, yeah, if, if you haven't like burnt a pallet to a crisp and just had your, your shop smelling of just burnt rubber, I don't know if you're a screen printer. <laughs> so, so we had, um, we had like, this is going back to that older, challenger two we had we also along with it had a like an old cayenne flash unit and for whatever reason it uh those are quartz bulbs which should shut off um when they're not you know in motion or you know like it has either like a motion sensor or it has a um a, a program that that you know they they go on anyways this one just didn't so you always had to remember like okay gotta make sure you turn that one off or else you know, it's just going to, it's just going to like uh pulse. And so it was my partner, Shane and I, and we had this uh, printer and we were in on a Saturday or a Sunday or something, just trying to catch up. And we were like, all right, let's just go, let's go grab some lunch. You know, it's been a good day, whatever. And so we go to lunch and then we come back and then just, we just see like smoke coming out of like the bottom of the door. And we're like, oh no. And like, we get in and just like, it was just pulsing onto uh this pallet and like if people are unfamiliar with uh m and r their their pallets have a have a piece of rubber on top and so this rubber was just like completely melted it smelled terrible for like a week an absolute week and it was just completely melted to shreds so which poses a problem right because you need every single pallet so we're like all right what do we what do we do so then you got to like scrape it off. And luckily we had extra rubber, but you got to scrape it off. Um, another really good. So this is, I don't know if I should say this on air, but uh, <laughs> this just goes to show like bootstrapping and like doing things wrong. Uh, going in, if you're changing pallet tape, you know, sometimes pallet tape gets stuck. You know, it's, you know, if you leave it on for too long, it just, it just doesn't want to come off. So we were using um, uh, like, what was it like lacquer thinner? So we'd use like mm -hmm. lacquer thinner and then we kind of dry it. Cause then it kind of dries up to a crisp and then you can kind of mm -hmm. just like scrape it off. Well, one time my partner, Shane, he just did it and it just lit up. Like it was like a huge light up in like, it was on one of those U line plastic carts. It's still here today. And it's just like kind of deformed and it just has like, <laughs> huge, like melting, like melt marks on it. But, um, yeah, so don't use your flash dryer next to uh, uh, combustible fluids. Mm, <laughs> is, mm, is, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. Or set the combustible fluids on top. I've seen that go south a oh, yes. times too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yep, exactly. Did Shane get scorched? He didn't actually, supposedly. Or maybe I think it like made some bits of his hair, but <laughs> I was expecting him to look back and not have any like eyebrows or. That's but crazy. I think yeah, he made it out. <laughs> on a serious note though, like, People really have to think about that. I know of one shop that actually burnt to the ground. I mean, it was a manual shop. 
same thing. They went to lunch and they left their flash over a wood pallet oh, with yeah. pallet tape on it. And, you know, they had a, a un, this is kind of a note too about keeping your shop clean, but they didn't clean their floors. And mm-hmm. so there was cotton yeah. and glue buildup all underneath this press. And all that happened was a piece of that paper lit up, fell on the floor and oh man it's just explosion whole thing. yeah yeah so cl- cleanliness make sure your flash is off but then make sure your floors don't have a bunch of cotton and glue because you want to talk about being able to start a fire quickly and probably yeah. all like aerosol spray oh yeah it's talk about yeah. a, a flammable Fumes cocktail central. there <laughs> yeah also uh, this this kind of ties in with the don't put your your spray tack or your screen cleaner on top of your dryer Correct. Because if it does go underneath, <laughs> it is not fun. It so goes boom. it goes mm-hmm. big boom. So, anyways, yeah. yeah. So going back. So don't put it on the flash. Don't put it on the dryer, and uh, you'll be just fine. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, now that we're talking flashes, let's let's talk flashes. I mean, we've got a few flashes. The the eco, the Evo. We've got a new dry run. Dry I run. know, Kevin, you run all Evo flashes, which are smart probe. Yep. Um, flashes. Do you want to talk a, a little bit about why you guys got into the smart probe and what it is, what it does for you and why it, why it makes sense? Yeah, it, totally. Um, so once again, going all the way back, we started with infrared panel flash uh, dryers. Uh, the first, you know, auto was all, and then we got our first quartz and we're like, this is the business. This is, this is really good. Um, you know, it takes less power because it pulses on. Um, it's, you know, it, it's not constantly on, so you don't really have to worry about if you left it over a pallet, um, unless you have a really old one. Um, <laughs> but um, for the most part, you don't. And then, so we're going back to some of those older uh, units and also uh, going back to infrared, um, we had a job where we were doing like a thousand tri-blend uh, hoodies, right? And it were, they were like the alternative apparel tri-blend hoodies. Those are expensive. They're expensive. They're like 12 or 13 bucks or something Mm -hmm. a piece. And it was a thousand of them. Right. And it was on a night shift and they weren't really monitoring the flash. So the flash was just going, was burning way too hot. And it Mm -hmm. just was like, and it was like the black one. So you couldn't really see the, Mm -hmm. the charred marks Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, so, but with, with tri-blend, you know, if it gets scorched, you just rip it like paper so the next morning I'm like, we're going through and we're folding and bagging these and like a person brings it up and was like, Hey man, these are like all ripping. And I was like, Oh no. And so, and it's like, at that point you're done. Like there's really nothing you can, there's nothing you could do to come back from that point. Um, so that was really the big proponent. We're like, okay, cool. We're done with old flashes. We're done with infrared flashes. Let's find out what's out there that will fix this problem. So we never have to worry about it again. It's a $13,000 mistake yeah so it was yeah, yeah. coming yeah. straight out of our pockets you know and you that was right before we were those. yeah and the, like we're that's when we were like putting all of our budgets and everything together for moving into our new shop and so we're like all right cool well let's take thirteen thousand dollars off of that budget now oh, so that could have been nice um but anyway so yeah so then that put us you know into the market uh and another reason we went with rocks was for the um smart probe flash it's actually reading the temperature of the garment and as long as you're setting that correctly and, you know, you have all of your settings down, um, you on paper should never uh, scorch another garment ever. And we really haven't. I, it's been after millions and millions of impressions on these machines, I can't even, it's like 0.0000001% we've actually scorched um, wow. just because we're able to read that temperature. So when you're running tri-blends, cool, drop that temperature down. Um, and then if you're going back to cottons, you know, bump it a little bit up and you will, uh, it, it, it's worth its weight in gold to go with that smart probe. Um, so that you don't run into those issues of like, Oh crap, we just scorched, you know, a hundred shirts, you know? Right. And how, jackets. how's starting up with the smart probe flash? Because I know, you know, the smart probe re- sends information to the press. So, as you kind of get started, you've got to heat everything up. You, you've got to go and you're running kind of slow. Um, 
So I know some people that have had them, it's kind of freaky. It's like, wait, I want to, you know, blast yeah. out 800 shirts an hour. So can you explain how that kind of works and and what the differences are there too, just kind of in getting in in the morning and getting everything started and warmed up? Yeah, totally. Um, a, yeah, so before, you know, we were doing, you know, dry runs, you know, before, this was before rock, we're doing dry runs and we're just, you know, warming up all of the pallets and all that stuff because essentially we were controlling how fast the machine went. We were, we were controlling that dwell time. And so then moving over to rocks with these smart probes, the smart probe uh, flash units are dictating the speed of the dry, of the press. Mm -hmm. So when you get going, you know, you might be at a 10 second dwell, you know, but then as those pallets, you know, continue to heat up and heat up, um, you're, you're bringing that dwell time down to almost as fast as you can load them. The thing I do like about that is because let's just say you have like a, a lint in the screen or you have, uh, you know, something that you just have to go over, do a quick fix, maybe like, uh, clean out some ink, re-ink or do something, you know, in the past you had to offload every single shirt because you have to get those, those pallets back up to temperature because once again, those flash units are just going to a certain temp. Um, whereas now, uh, you know, you could stop with all your shirts on press, you can go and do that quick thing. And then you start it again. And then the, the, probes are going to recognize, oh, hey, we got to go a little bit longer on these, you know, so maybe you run at two seconds. Okay, now it's going back up to a six second dwell, you know, so mm -hmm. I think it's a really nice feature to not have to worry about it. Because once again, you're trying to, uh, what I always say about screen printing is you're trying to reduce the amount of variables because there's just so many. Um, right. So you've just Great. reduced another variable um, and you don't have to rely upon, okay, this guy over here, this press operator, he really knows about temperatures and this person really doesn't, you know, we could just throw somebody on and they're able, the machine is, is running the show, you know, not the, not the person. That's really insightful. And then I know too, like one of the big differences with flashes, a lot of flashes have to be on a, a head, right? Yeah. So they eat up, they eat up a print head and ours, you know, are movable. Um, do you guys move many of the flashes? I know that's like a big thing on the rock presses. We've got command ports. You can kind of, you know, you've got one drop that goes to your press for your electricity and then everything else just kind of connects to it. So do you guys do a bunch of moving or do you kind of have what works for you? We do. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously we, what we did is we ordered the, the, the presses without the, you know, on the 1620, we ordered it without the third head because that's always your, you know, your second or third head is always just going to be flashing the white ink. Mm -hmm. So you never really use that head other than if you have to like take a part off or something like that. Um, but other than that, yeah, we change, we move the other ones around all the time, just depending upon the job, you know, cause you have some inks that you want to flash after. Um, and then you, sometimes you don't, you know, so then we could just, uh, we have a ton of flexibility in moving those, uh, second two or three flash units around. That's awesome. That used to always be a big headache for me because ours was, you know, stagnant, stagnant in the head. And I, I actually used all my old flashes from my manual and I'd roll them over to the auto, you know, and yeah. just hope that my image wasn't too big and, and it would work out. But uh, it is tough to run that way when you don't have that flexibility. So that's sure. cool. Yeah. And, and those, the, I, what I really love about those, uh, the rock flashes is that they're just so low profile and like, they don't weigh a ton, you know? So some of those other ones, you know, they could get pretty bulky. Whereas these, like you can easily with a couple, you know, one person just move it around really easily. It's awesome. Does it uh, make you feel more worldly, uh, reading your flash temperatures in Celsius? In Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, you know, we're, we're learning new stuff, you know, every day. <laughs> so yeah. Like, cause somebody would be like, man, that, I, some, people, some people who are not familiar with it being in Celsius, they're like, you're only curing, you're, you know, you're only flashing at 130 degrees. And I'm like, no, it's Celsius. So, mm -hmm. But yeah. I had to get so, used to that too. My ice bath at home is in Celsius. Is so I've really? got a, a yeah temperature gauge because what's interesting is like in Fahrenheit, I can't get to the hundredth of uh, or 10th or hundredth of the temperature. When I switch it to Celsius, I can keep my bath at exactly 32.9 degrees. So it, it doesn't have ice on the top. Mm -hmm. If I go to Fahrenheit, that makes me go to 32 and it freezes it over. So mm -hmm. I like the flexibility. It kind of makes more sense. I just wish that it does we, make didn't, more sense. we didn't yeah. change everything, you yeah. know, however many 
<laughs> years ago that we decided to get rid of metric. Got to be, got to be different. Yeah, I guess so. You know, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> exactly. How st- how stoked yeah, uh, so are you, Kevin? I'm super stoked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm stoked. Yeah, I know we always catch people. They're like, I'm stoked. And they're like, Oh, oh yeah, I'm stoked. I'm like, Yeah, I get it all the time. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. How did you uh, how did you come up with that name? Our friend Khalil came up with it. Yeah. So we were we were just still in the garage, and uh, you know he was like, Man, it should just be like stoked on purdy. And we're like, All right, cool. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> you know, because like we we're doing like all the name games, and it's like, do we use the letters of our name? And we're like, No, like you know that doesn't really fit us. You know, it's a cool thing to do for some people, but it doesn't really fit us. And uh, yeah, and then we saw stoked on purdy, and we're like, All right, that makes sense. You know, like we're a couple, you know, kids who played in bands and. We don't really like, you know, we're still wearing shirts and shorts to work and, you know, it kind of encompasses the ethos of what we're, we're trying to do here. It I'm does. Awesome. I've, I've, it's one of the coolest names uh, yeah, of a print sure. shop that I've come across. And I think it, uh, when, when people meet you guys, I feel like to your point, it's like simpatico, the name like describes sure. the people and vice versa. Yeah. It's no, awesome. yeah, true. Yeah, no, it definitely uh, puts in perspective, you know, like we're always trying to, um, you know, a a, a lot of what screen printing can be is like mundane, you know, and and we are here to make money, but it's also a really cool medium. Like it's something that's like, you know, super old and and it it could be used in so many different types of ways um, that I think some people forget about that. And, you know, just being stoked on printing is just uh, the ability to realize that, hey, it's a shirt, you know, and, and we're printing out tons of shirts every day, but it's still such a cool way that we get to make our living and to uh, do what we get to do every day. Absolutely. It is great perspective too, because I think a lot of times that gets lost as you grow up and scale a business, like as yeah. things get bigger and more stressful and there's more weight and there's more deadlines, the funness that started in the, in the garage or whatever, like you start to lose it. And as you guys grow, if you can kind of take that name and, and take that company culture and that ethos and have it grow with you, I think that's really important to make it continue to be fun. So you enjoy getting up every day, going into the shop. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we do a lot of contract work, you know, and, um, which cannot be super fun and you're not dealing with maybe sometimes the most fun customers, but, um, you know, when people are like, Oh, I'm sending you to stoked on printing. I think they get a little bit more excited, you know, or like they kind of, you know, think about it maybe in a little bit more positive light. So it kind of goes both ways. That's awesome, man. Why don't you tell our listeners how to, uh, check out what you guys are doing and give them a little information about what all services uh, you offer as well as maybe your website and uh, social um, handles and stuff. So people can check you out. Yeah. So we, um, you know, so we're on Instagram and we're pretty active there. Um, You know, we're always showing like different prints, what we got going on in the shop. We really try to peel back the curtain um, because that's something we really wanted when we were young and we were starting out. We loved seeing pictures of bigger shops or like seeing what people were doing. Like it's, it's just such a cool, fun thing to do because uh, we're all kind of figuring it out in a different way. So when you get to see somebody and see somebody shopping, like, Oh, that makes so much sense that they, we should do it that way. You know? So we try to peel a lot of that curtain back and show a lot of our processes, uh, our equipment, you know, what we're printing. Um, So that's Instagram.com backslash stoked on printing. Um, our website is just stokedonprinting.com. Um, for the contract side of our business, we actually just launched uh, contractdecorators.com. So nice. even if Smart. even if you're yeah, so even if you're a smaller shop um, and you want to kind of leverage our capabilities, um, you know we we sell shirts at a you know pretty much the case pricing, and uh, you know so it's a very easy platform to order um, shirts through. So we're, you know we're really trying to get some of the you know smaller shops, uh, or, you know, we have a 16 color 20 station station press, which is not realistic for a lot of, uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. So you get to kind of leverage some of our capabilities. You know, we also do embroidery and direct to garment. So, uh, it just kind of gives something else to your customer base that you don't have to worry about. Okay. Now I have to bring in all this equipment now. Um, so yeah, so that's contractdecorators.com. And then we'll also be having a, um, a, a, a print on demand platform coming out hopefully within the next two to three months. Um, so there'll be like a free print on demand store builder. Um, and that's called merch loop. And so that's merchloop.com. 
That's awesome. Yeah. Well, very good, man. Well, I appreciate you sharing uh, your time with us today. Uh, again, I want to thank Kevin of Stoked On Printing for joining us. Thank Brian Richards for taking time out of the end of the month. Both of you actually got to love end of the month. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Both as a business owner, as a sales uh, person. I mean, it's uh, it's always a crazy time. Um, want to thank uh, everyone that that tuned in today, to listen to us, and thank Mr. Merrill Caps for putting this whole thing together. Thank you. Um, next week we will be, or actually next show, which will be in two weeks, um, we're going to talk about um, the industry as a whole, more from a data. Uh, sense. We're going to talk about what the industries look like through COVID, where we think it's going, kind of the boom of digital, which which Kevin in this show touched on a, a little bit that they they do. But I mean, that market uh, direct to consumer is just absolutely taking off right now. And consumer buying habits have changed. And I was reading a lot of reports, actually I'll give a little preview here of, of our next show. But um you know, it's changed for good. I mean, COVID has effectively changed the way that people are going to continue to shop, um, which which really sucks for, you know, our retail owners out there. But, um, you know, there's always that option to pivot into direct to consumer printing, direct to consumer digital. Um, and it, it really is going to be, you know, kind of the wave of the future. So we're going to have a deep dive into that, go over some some data, some figures that we found um and it'll be a great great show just to kind of do like an industry update so again thank you kevin for joining us today man we really appreciate having having you here and uh tune in uh next show rock on awesome thanks guys all right thank you good to see you man cheers great seeing you later Huge thanks to our special guest, Kevin Oakley of Stoked On Printing and Rock US's own channel manager, Brian Richards, for participating today. And as always, thank you for spending time with us this week. Tune in at your convenience wherever you listen to your podcast by searching Rock Shop Talk. That's R-O-Q, Shop Talk. On our next show, we'll feature the subject of data-driven printing. If you'd like to request to be on the show, please visit rock.us slash rock shop talk. If you found today's episode helpful, the greatest accolade we could ask for is for you to recommend it to a friend who you think may find it helpful as well. Please like, share, and subscribe on social media. Until next time, rockers, press onward.